everyone. Uh, I'm Sylvain. Um, and I'm Lysander. And today we're going to talk to you about how to run a very large language model on uh, consumer hardware. And so language models, uh, sorry, deep learning models, especially language models, are becoming larger and larger. And um, for instance, Big Science Bloom and Mitaya's OPT are 70, uh, 176 billion parameters. And it can be a bit painful to run them uh, on, small, on a small setup. At Hugging Face, uh, we're committed to make machine learning more accessible, which also means making the super large models as easy to run as possible. You might know the Transformers library, I think uh, it was in one or two talks today, uh, which allows you to quickly download and use more than 60,000 checkpoints for 160 architectures. And for instance, here is all the necessary code you need to run BERT. And here is all the necessary code you need to run Bloom. Mm, except that you're going to need 350 gigabytes of RAM uh, if you're using FP16, or 700 gigabytes of RAM if you're using full precision. And so that code uh, might crash, for example, on my machine, which has a limited amount of RAM and uh, only 488 gigabytes of uh, GPU memory. So we might need a couple more adjustments. We chose this setup with two GPUs and a lot, uh, lot of CPU RAM for the demo on purpose to demonstrate uh, how you can run a model with a mix of model parallelism, CPU offload, and disk offload. It would work the same way with just one GPU, as the main requirement is to have enough disk memory to host the whole checkpoint. So here is how you need to adapt your code so that it can run on my machine. It can also run on the cluster that trained Bloom, on a couple of GPUs in the cloud, or my machine, just one GPU, um, as long as you have enough memory to host the whole checkpoint. And even if you don't have enough GPU or CPU memory to host the whole model. Thank you. And, and so the traditional workflow when loading a model in PyTorch is that you first start by initializing a model with random weights, um, and then you load the checkpoints in memory once you have this checkpoint loaded in memory, you take this and you put it inside the randomly initialized checkpoint. However, with Bloom, uh, that weighs 350 gigabytes in FP16, well, this doesn't really work on a traditional system with 32 gigabytes of RAM. As soon as you randomly initialize the model, then you're running out of RAM. And then when you load the checkpoint weight, well, then you're at 700 gigabytes, and then this just doesn't really work. Um, in terms of uh, comparison, loading ImageNet, like the training set of ImageNet pre-processed with images of 224 by 224, is a about 700 gigabytes, so it's quite a bit. Uh, like when compared to BERT, for example, it's about 400 megabytes, so you can definitely do this workflow. So here we're using a neat little trick introduced by, in PyTorch 1.9. Uh, here is a regular tensor which contains several attributes, including the shape, the D-type, and the data, and the data being the core of it all. But in PyTorch 1.9, they introduced the meta tensor, which is about the same, except you don't load the data. So here it takes no space, and it's extremely fast to load. And so that's exactly what we're doing here. We're importing the init empty weights method from Accelerate, using it as a context manager. And when we load the model within that context manager, what's really happening under the hood is that we're basically loading all the weights on the meta device. And so as you can see below, uh, the current RAM used is zero because we're not loading any data. There is still the issue of the checkpoints weight being too much, and I'll let Sylvain explain how we handle that. And so uh, that's why in Transformers, we've implemented checkpoint charting. Uh, instead of having this wall uh, 350 gigabyte file which contains all the weights, let's split it in smaller files and each file contains just a few layers of weights. But uh, if you try to load all those weights inside your model, you're still going to hit the same problem. So you need to decide in advance where you're going to load everything, uh, you, to use the GPU space as much as possible, then the CPU, and then leave on the disk what doesn't fit. And so that's where, um, so here is the whole uh, model uh, that's, uh, with all the layers, and that's where having uh, this meta tensor is super useful. Uh, because we already know the shape and the D-type, even if we don't have any data, we can still do the multiplication uh, shape by D-type and know how much memory it's going to take. 
And with that, we're able to decide, for instance, here that the embeddings on layer one are going to go on the first GPU, then layer two to four on the second GPU, then we go off to the CPU because we don't have any space, and we leave the rest uh, on the disk. This is what the device map equal auto argument uh, meant in the code that we showed you earlier. Uh, that's, um, so you can set it to a proper device map. You can decide, I'm going to put the embeddings on that device, the layer zero on that device, or you can let Accelerate decide for you. As the advantage of letting Accelerate decide for you, it's going to adapt uh, itself to your setup. So if you have lots of GPUs, it's going to use them all. If you have just one GPU but lot of CPU RAM, it's going to maximize the memory of your GPU and then use the CPU. Or if you are like my machine with a little bit of GPU, a little bit of CPU, it's going to fill that and then leave the rest on the disk. And so then it's just a game of going uh, uh, over all the checkpoint charts and load all the weights right on the device that we decided uh, that we're going on. This way, you don't get out of RAM while it's your your model. And once you're done iterating, you have a model that looks a little bit like this, uh, split between GPU 0, GPU 1, CPU, and all the disk. And so once you have this model loaded over many different devices, the question that arises is, how do you handle the inputs and how do you propagate those through devices? And so here we first start by putting the inputs on the first device, so the first GPU that contains the embeddings and the first layer. As you'll see, it has some space available. It has 20 out of 24 gigabytes taken, and we'll see in a bit why is that exactly. So we first propagate the inputs through the layers hosted on this first GPU and get the hidden states then we that, that we then put on the second GPU to be passed through the subsequent layers. So we pass them through layer two, three, and four, and then comes layer five. Layer five is currently hosted on CPU, which is way less efficient than just doing the operation on GPU. So what we're doing then is going back to the first GPU, but putting the fifth layer directly on that GPU to perform the operations. Once we're done performing the operations there, we drop the fifth layer, load the sixth layer, directly within this GPU as well. And so the same process happens for the disk. However, disks uh, are like loading a model, loading, sorry, a layer from the disk to GPU takes more time, of course, than loading it from CPU to disk, uh, to GPU. Uh, so we'd rather put everything on CPU, but uh, we don't all have the luxury of a 700 gigabyte machine. So we load the, all the layers hosted on disk uh, down to the decoder uh, until we reach the last layer of the model. So how does this look in practice? How does this look in code, given all the context switching and all the device switching? Um, so first, we're going to start by instantiating the model, as we have seen before with the device map equals auto, which spreads the layers on the different devices automatically. Then we add the offload state dict equals true. This is a parameter just for safety to ensure that we're not blowing up the RAM. It takes a bit more time to instantiate the model, but this way we're sure we're not running out of RAM. Finally, we specify the torch D type, torch float 16, as we don't want uh, 700 gigabytes to be taken for the model. 350 is much more than enough. And so what the full uh, inference looks like is we first have the model initialization. We then load the tokenizer, uh, the appropriate tokenizer, and we tokenize a question. Here it's question, can I run Bloom on a single GPU? Answer, and we want to predict the, the next token. So we encode that, and here we have the single line that is device specific. We pass this on the first GPU, so 2.0. Then we perform inference. There's no device specific code here. It's all handled um, within the model by the hooks that we have put inside according to the different devices. And then we retrieve the last token, do the argmax on it, and decode it. In total, it took two minutes and 24 seconds to load the model, which is 300 gigabytes, once again, on a very small machine. Uh, the inference took a minute and 50, which is non-negligible, but it, it, at least it runs. And the answer that the model printed is yes. And so, as I said before, that same code runs on any kind of setups that you might have. So here is a bit of a, a comparison uh, across multiple setups. So obviously, if you have enough GPU space uh, towards the world model, it's going to run faster. So on 8 a 100 uh, with 80 gigabit of RAM, uh, you can have the whole 350 gigabytes of the model on GPUs, and it takes 230 milliseconds uh, to run a full uh, forward pass. And since uh, you have a lot uh, of GPU memory on this setup, you can even use a bigger batch size uh, and go to batch size equal 42 before you go out of RAM. And this way, you have an inference that goes at 10 milliseconds per token. 
Um, then if you don't have enough GPU space, obviously it's going to take a bit longer uh, because you have all these layers of on the CPU that you're going to need to put one by one uh, as, we, as we go through the forward pass. Uh, and so as we go through smaller and smaller setups, we can see that the more layer of loading on CPUs or the disk, uh, the longer the end front gets. And one thing that's very important uh, if you're looking at smaller setups uh, is the I.O. speed between the disk uh, and the CPU or GPU. And as you can see, my machine, which is smaller than uh, 2A100 on GCP, for instance, still goes way faster because it has an NVMe. And uh, so the, going from the disk to the GPU uh, goes actually super fast. And that's all we had for you. Thanks a lot for listening to us. And we hope we find all tools useful when playing with large language models. Thank you. Thank you.